babies, flowers, and kittens embedded in apples, pears, teardrops, and logs are just some of the forms you might find in this glasswork. She juxtaposes kitschy decals from the 60s and 70s with Victorian-era aesthetics to create sleek, odd, and humorous objects for reflection. Nostalgia for the past is conjured, but best left encased in glass. On this edition of Art Now, we'll look at the work of Amy Rufert. Welcome to Art Now, a program where we talk to artists whose work is part of our community. Today we're talking with Amy Rufert, uh, a glass artist in Urbana. Amy, where did, were you born? Laconia, New Hampshire. And um, when did you come to Urbana? My husband and I moved here from San Francisco about three, just about three years ago. And is San Francisco where you were trained? No, well, being a glass worker, yeah, I, I moved around a lot and sort of went with the opportunity was and so I I went to Massachusetts College of Art in Boston then I did some studying at Ohio State and then I eventually moved to Seattle Washington which is a huge glass community and got a lot of training and studied there so when did you start making art um, well I always as a really tiny kid I used to draw a lot and uh, I had a grandfather who was very crafty and he was a uh, construction worker, but he would make dollhouses and dollhouse furniture, so he made me a ton of that. And he always encouraged me to draw and to do things with him that were, were really creative. And my mom, too, they used to always encourage me to draw, so I used to draw a ton when I was a kid. And how did that translate into glass later on in your Well, life? you know, it was funny, because in high school, I did a lot of painting, and I never really thought of making work as a three-dimensional thing until I got to college. And then I realized that my voice was really in making three-dimensional objects. So it was that transition in college, seeing what else was out there and, and how the flat, the medium of 2D just wasn't really where I wanted to be when I explored other areas. And, and who introduced you to glass? Were you, did you go to a school with a glass? Yeah, I did. I actually was going to Mass Art for art education. And I just felt like I needed that uh, security or that, that stability of knowing that I was going to have a job when I got out of college. But I took, uh, and I was struggling with the classes right off because it, it was very heavy in uh, teaching. The very first class was all about teaching, and I wasn't ready for that. I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to make as an artist. And I took an elective class um, in glass blowing, and I only took it because I had a roommate that said, oh, I'm taking this really great glass blowing class. I don't think you'll like it. I think you actually, as she said, it's really, really hard. I don't think you'll like it. And, you know, I wouldn't recommend it. So I was like, okay, I'm taking it. <laughs> and that was all I really needed to to sign up for the class. The class was really difficult to get into because everybody wanted to try glass blowing and I got in and I just loved it from the first second, from the first class. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about your work and then we'll also talk a little bit about how the work is made. Mm -hmm. um, so the first series of work that we're looking at now is called Curios um, and this is relief work, is that correct? It is. It's, it's more like I think of them as three-dimensional paintings almost. Um, they either hang on the wall or on a metal stand and they come out from the wall about anywhere from three to six inches. And this work is based on sort of looking into interior worlds. I have a huge snow globe collection and so that this body of work was influenced by that collection. And so by using this sort of dome um, almost like magnifying glass on the top, it creates this illusion of a, a It depth does. It, the a optics of the glass are really beautiful here, and they create this this feeling of, of that you're peering into another world, but also that there's quite a bit of distance between you and this other world, just as you would look at a snow globe, or, and maybe it brings you, to a, brings you back to a memory or another time in your life or forces you to create certain associations within the 
within the work. And can you talk about the images that you use in the work? A lot of it, a lot of them are animals, um, and I'm wondering what your association with that is, and also where the images come from. Are those handmade by you, or no? The doing? images, um, the images are really commercially produced ceramic decals. They're made for commercial ceramics, but often you'll find them on plates and bowls and cups and vases. And I've worked out ways to make them compatible with the glass. So I do a lot of testing and a lot of research to make them fit. Um, and animals, I've, I've used animals a lot because I have a huge, I have an incredible stash of vintage decals. And the more I call through this stash, the more I develop this personal relationship with these images. And to me, the animals have become very, very human. And I use them almost in, in a very figurative way to express relationships or um, just to, um, I have a really, you know, I have a huge love of animals. And I think that they, instead of being so literal and using these like figurative human elements, I think that animals convey the same sense of emotion and connection. Um, with the next series that we're looking at here, this is a series called Logs. And um, here you're mixing sort of animals and these nature scenes. Yeah. Um, and the first image that we're looking at is a log um, un under a bell jar. And it really sort of sets up almost like a museological relationship to these objects. Um, it very much mimics like the object in the vitrine in the mm -hmm. museum. So can you talk about how you're using the bell jar and this relationship between nature and... Sure, sure. The bell jar first started for me because I felt like it's not always easy for me to embark on like making work. And so the bell jar gave me the space and the room that I needed to create a world that was my own, that I felt was very separate from everyone and everything else, that I could do exactly what I wanted to do within that space. And I also do like the, the sort of way it makes it precious and takes it away from you, just like it's again sort of influenced by the snow globe, but just how you can look into something and it can remove you from the situation that you're in and make you question what is going on in there, what what is happening. And with the log with blue roses, I had always, I had come across a huge stash of blue rose decals and I've always thought they were beautiful. And the only other time I've seen blue roses was in, uh, in Barcelona. And I thought they were so fantastic because they're so magical because you never would find that in nature. And so that's something I'd always sort of taking something that you see these beautiful roses, but you're like, they're blue. You know, it makes you think about, well, what's going on there? Um, and the log, the I felt like the log is a really good format for me. It's a really good vehicle for for imagery because if you were to cut you to take a tree and cut it, it's going to give you a lot of information on the inside, more than you would ever know by just looking at the actual tree. And that's how I feel like these decals, these, lo these logs are a great format and vehicle for me to have imagery on because they tell a different story on the inside than they do on the outside. And a lot of these, a lot of this work also combines different elements from different design eras which is also something that I'm very interested in. Also different cultural areas, you have um, eras. You have um, a series with JFK and the Hand of Christ. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering how you decided to use these sort of historical figures. Well, I grew up Catholic, and I had always, I had this crazy fascination with JFK when I was a little kid, and every sort of report and uh, oral report and book report was done either on JFK, on the assassination of <laughs> JFK, on anything around JFK. And so I'd always, when I had found these decals, I was like, oh, this is perfect, this is perfect. And the connection between, you know, the hand of Christ and JFK and how iconic he is. And then uh, the actual, the image on the, on the branch of the log is actually of two horses, sort of neck and neck. So it was, uh, the original title of this piece was like, uh, I think it was JFK, the Hand of Christ, and the Day at the Races. <laughs> but I dropped that part eventually to let people come up with their own ideas when they see the horse at the, at the end of the twig. Um, as we're looking at these pieces that are um, three-dimensional versus the pieces that are um, relief-based, I'm wondering if you could 
talk a little bit about how these works are made. Yeah, that it's a little bit of a complicated discussion because it involves a lot of um, a lot of dis a lot of talk about what happens in a hot shop. So basically, what I've done is d I've done a lot of testing with the imagery, and I've found ways to fire the imagery onto flat pieces of sheet glass that are compatible with glass that I would use in a furnace. So this isn't something that I can do in my house. I need access to a, a facility to fire on the decals and then also to um, to work with the material in the hot shop. And it's basically I'm sculpting hot glass uh, with a lot of metal tools. When you say fire the decals on uh, to the sheet glass, is that done in a kiln? Or is it that is. Done it's, okay. it's done in a kiln and it's a process that uh, it's actually a multi-step process that I have to do long before I even reach the hot shop stage. So it gets done, the glass is cooled and sort of stored until you're ready to it's use it. It's cooled and stored and then once again brought up to a certain temperature so that I can combine it with the hot glass. But it involves, this work is very intensive uh, prep, preparatory work. I have a lot of prep work that I have to do before I get to these final stage, to these stages where I take it in the shop and use it. And does the log work, um, the, the three-dimensional pieces, are those um, a completely different process than the relief pieces, or are the relief Actually, pieces the, also blown? Actually, the relief pieces and the log pieces are very similar because they're solid. Okay. So they're all hot, uh, sculpted, solid glass. And the work that you'll see coming up, it, they're at, it's actually turn, it's more hollow work. Okay, let's look at that. So we're going to a series titled Fancy Fruit. And I see here you've also elevated the object on sort of a pedestal, mm -hmm. so to speak, but using um, a more popularly cultural form of the, like, cake plate. Cake plate, yeah. Um, so these are um, blown pieces. Can mm -hmm. you describe That's right. what we're looking at? The piece is called a wallpaper fruit, and that, that is a blown piece. Um, and it's also, I choose the imagery of the fruit because I'm really interested in people being able to enter their work through a familiar form. They can approach the work and they can say, oh, this is a peach or this is a piece of fruit. And then that gets them involved closer and more intimately with the material that's going on within the piece, the collaged imagery. And also there's a bunch of, uh, on top of the collaged imagery, there's cane patterning, which is a traditional Italian technique. So it's another layer to the imagery. It's another way to sort of diffuse and obscure the imagery underneath. Also involving some more I guess technical, more technical aspects of glass working and very traditional aspects of glass working. And I also combine other elements within these pieces. A lot of found glass, and this is pressed glass from probably the 50s and the 60s. Um, so what part is pressed glass? Is that the, the pressed glass is generally the cake plates okay. and also those are actually parts of different things that I cut up and combine together. I don't necessarily use if I find an object, I don't necessarily use it in its entirety. I generally cut things up and add parts and change things so that I get the the pedestal or the, the found piece that I want. So that's the nice thing about glass. You can just sort of cut it up and stick it together in different ways. And then also you'll notice that on the base of the cake plate, there's generally like a really nice, bright, vibrant color. And that's a type of glass called vitrolite. It was an architectural glass used in the 30s and the 40s for building fronts. And, I, and we actually, I think we might even actually have some in downtown Champaign. So if you go by downtown Champaign, um, I can't remember exactly what street it is, but I think it's an old jewelry store. You might see some vitrolite that's still used today. It was a really beautiful and densely colored glass that was used to decorate the fronts of buildings or the interiors of bathrooms. And that, and that glass, that you can get it as is and then work it in the hot shop. Yeah. Well, I actually don't work it in the hot shop. I, it's actually cold carving. It's oh, actually wow. grinding and carving. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And this glass, it's not made anymore. So anytime I find it, it's usually because I've come into an old scavenged pile or run, come across some. It's a really beautiful material, and it's just not cost effective to make anymore because it's so dense with pigment, and it's just not not used as a building material anymore, but it's it's beautiful. The next work, the next series of work called um, Patchwork and Quilt has similar sort of patterns as the Fancy Fruit series, um, but it, the forms that you're laying those patterns on are different. 
Um, can you talk about this series? Sure, they are a little different. These, these, this teardrop shape I was really into for a while because I thought of it as, I thought of them as uh, sort of grandma, grandma tears in a way. I've always like people have often told me, and I'm sure a lot of um, viewers make that connection to my glass that it's very grandmotherly, mm -hmm. and uh, with the doilies and and the forms. But the shape to me, sort of the drop, that form in glass is a very it's a very natural form for the material to take on. Glass wants to fall into a drop, a combination of gravity and the material. It wants to become that form. And so I was always thinking of that as like the real, the real meat and the real basis of glass. And also the idea of a tear. And I always thought that if these, if these patterns and these decals were living and breathing, you know, if they could cry, this would be it. Or if they could bleed, this would be it. And I use the patchwork imagery on these because I'm really inspired by Victorian quilts and the Victorian era and the idea of what people collected in Victorian times and why it was important and very significant to that period. These forms share a lot of aesthetic um, similarities to the paper rates and um, other glass forms that are traditional. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how your work um, has a um, a lightness to traditional glass and mm -hmm. how it departs from, how it uh, functions in a more contemporary glass world. Yeah, that's a great question because it's it's something that I definitely strive to do because I think people have a very specific idea of what glass is when they think of contemporary glass and traditional glass. And, you know, the immediate, the household name is Dale Chihuly when you think of contemporary glass. And where I'm incredibly indebted to Dale Chihuly, I really, it's important to me that I show that there are other ways of working with the material and other things that the material can do. Um, and I love that people can enter the work and, and think, this reminds me of a paperweight. But it's, it's, I think it, not that it's any more important than a paperweight, but I think it pushes you to think of the material and the conceptual material that's going on within the work in a different way. Um, I also think uh, that contemporary, it's an interesting thing. I have a lot of people come up to me and say, I've never seen this before. I've never seen this kind of, and that's always really gratifying, you know, because I think I'm trying really hard to push the boundaries of the material and to make people think about it in a different way. So the last series we're going to talk about is your trophy series. And again, it uses a contemporary form, a popular uh, culture form, but you're using completely different um, shapes and forms and ways of thinking about mm -hmm. a trophy. And um, similarly, the image in, in this particular piece titled uh, Clowns, Cherries, and Chickens, some of the imagery is obscured. Uh, you want to talk about that more? Sure, sure. And, and this is really new work. All this work I've started since about uh, 2006, really. And so this work is very, the trophy forms specifically are very current. And I've always been interested in that really totemic form. And just the weight and the, the conceptual weight that that form alone carries, I think, is, is really powerful. And also this idea of a trophy and how you're awarded trophies and... And these become collections, and these become part of your life and what you have in your daily, what you communicate with daily. And so I'm interested in challenging people on that idea, thinking about ownership of their, their trophies, so to speak, and also sort of changing that format and making and challenging you, what, what, well, what is a trophy and what would you get a trophy for? And this, this piece in particular, this piece was, I was making a connection with a lot of my decals and the idea of the gaze, you know, that this idea of in painting and art history, a really rich subject of the gaze, and how many of these decals where the gaze was really, really important and was the focal point of these decals. So I cut out that, um, that, that gaze in every, in every decal that I assembled in this piece. And the other work with the, the clown and the cherries and the chickens. The clown, the clown decal to me was such a powerful decal. It's just so rich in color, but it's also just so um, frightening mm -hmm. in a way. So I wanted to obscure it a little bit, but I, 
but by obscuring it in a way, I made it even more uh, intense because it actually looks like the clown's behind bars. And so this this idea of the clown and how potentially scary and wonderful a clown can be at the same time was something I wanted to present the viewer with. Um, you use a lot of representation in your work and um, representational figures or objects beside other representational figures and objects. And I was wondering about the role of juxtaposition. Um, is that something that you really try to play with? Yeah, it is. It is because uh, like there's this one one log piece that I did was it was called uh, Let Sleeping Babies Lie. And it was this beautiful image on one side of this baby just sleeping on it, sleeping really blissfully. And then on the other side, it was this uh, field of paisley pattern and then there was a little cutout and there was a fox and so I'm interested in sort of getting people to think about these ideas of um, I want people to, I have a story about the decals and the imagery but I want people to have enough room in my story to come up with their own connections and their own stories because I think that I'm really interested in that relationship that the viewer can have with this work and the dialogue and that that dialogue can change too but I'm interested in really what people come up with in the stories they make because sometimes they're they're amazing the connections that people can make with the work and I really enjoy that and make the work a lot about that connection. Amy's work can be found at Cinema Gallery here in Urbana also at the New Harmony Gallery of Contemporary Art in New Harmony, Indiana. Amy's also represented by Ken Saunders Gallery in Chicago. You can also find her work at our website amyrufert.com. Thanks for watching Art Now. My guest has been Amy Rufert. I hope today's show will inspire you to look at the local art scene and make your own art now.